Another year has come and gone, but the jihadis still want to kill us. Some may think a new day has dawned, but the jihadis are like gorillas. That's why David Wood is here tonight. With knowledge, he'll instill us. Ladies and gentlemen, it ain't Shakespeare. It's this week in jihad. Ladies and gentlemen, happy new year. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy whatever it is you got. We are here with the great David Wood. We are here full of jihad for the new year. And what could be more of an occasion of good cheer than that? David, good evening and good morning. Did, did you rhyme gorillas with instill us or something like that? I did. I did. Did you like that? <laughs> I, I'm, nice. I've been working on, you know, actually, I have to admit, I was inspired by the great poet Bob Dylan, who once rhymed January with Buenos Aires. You can hear that in his great song, the, uh, oh, happy Kwanzaa, everybody. I forgot that one. Uh, you can hear that in The Groom Still Waiting at the Altar, which is a little known but great song. There's a, there's, a, yes. there's, a famous, there's a famous clip of uh, the rapper Eminem saying that he gets ticked off when people say you can't rhyme anything with orange. And he goes on this tirade of things, of rhyming things with orange by like combining one word with another that gives you the, the that gives yeah. you a rhyme and so on. So yeah, yeah, people think, oh, there's not a one word rhyme for orange. But if you, he says, once you understand the science of rhyming, you can get it. But it sounds like you understand the science of rhyming. My, my hat is off to Mr. Mathers. I have to admit, isn't that his name? Uh, I was trying mm -hmm. to impress you, David, by knowing Eminem's name. Um, Power. My, uh, my, <laughs> my hat's off to him, though. I would not have expected that kind of lyrical sophistication, I have to admit. Uh, but in any case, we have to go with this here. I choose the gorilla. <laughs> Actually, though, the line from the deathless classic poem that started this evening's proceedings off, the line, the jihadis are like gorillas, was inspired by the Quran, of course, which says that the unbelievers are like animals. That is uh, chapter 8, verse 55. They are like cattle, only worse, as if cattle were bad. I mean, who doesn't love cattle? Chapter 7, verse 179. And they are, of course the most vile of created beings, chapter 98, verse 6. And we got a lot of action on that, uh, David, this week, unfortunately. Uh, actually, I thought that uh, in light of our discussion right before the uh, show went live here and we got our international audience, I should note that uh, Sheikh Yunus Kathrada from our neighbor to the north, the Dominion of Canada. He uh, is in the news again, and he is being defensive about the 72 virgins. And you can see here from the caption from the video at Memory, the Middle East Media Research Institute, the 72 virgins that they laugh about and mock us about. And you know how he hates that, because as Thomas More said, the devil is a proud spirit. He cannot endure to be mocked. The, th the worst thing you can do to a jihadi or a jihad sympathizer is ridicule. They just, they, they can't handle that because they are so very proud. But he said, let us see who will have the last laugh. David, I, I thought this was interesting on a number of levels. But first, yeah, tell us, tell us what you think. Oh, uh, two things. One, I think the actual quote was, uh, so they're making fun of us for having 72 virgins, eh? I think that was the actual quote. Yes, because uh, he is in Canada. And I'm just and waiting. Let's I'm head, just waiting. head over to Tim's and get a donut. I, I'm just waiting for uh, someone, because Chloe's, Chloe's in here. I'm just waiting for someone to say it's not 72 virgins, it's 72 space virgins. That's, uh, that's the new he, thing. Yeah, that's the new thing. But I, I wanted to bring to your attention, actually, in connection with this, a uh, hadith from Sunan ibn Majah. And uh, it's interesting to note, David, I think a lot of people do not realize this. A lot of Muslims who are all geared up to be enjoying their 72 virgins in the great bordello in paradise forever, they don't realize this little detail that Sunan ibn Majah gives us, that is, that Muhammad gives us. There is no one whom Allah will admit to paradise 
but Allah will marry him to 72 wives, two from the Huris and 70 from his inheritance from the people of hell. Mm -hmm. So, yep. you know, even Kathrata says, you know, you're going to get the 72 Huris, eh? But you're not. Mm -hmm. You're only going to get two. And the other 70 are women who've been damned to hell. So we're talking about, who knows, drug addicts, prostitutes, uh, uh, all kinds of sinners, the, the worst of the worst, and the 70 of them are going to be working off their sentence by working in the paradise, paradisial bordello. Yeah, and someone might think, a woman might think, well, you know, hey, at least we won't be in hell. But think about this. So this is talking about like uh, Christians and Jews and they go to hell and then but the women then become the sex slaves of jihadis in paradise. So that would kind of be hell for a woman. I mean, you're getting banged by uh, Osama bin Laden for all eternity. Yeah. Or worse, uh, one of those other guys, Adam mm -hmm. Gadan or uh, al -Laki. You know, a lot of people said... Uh, when Al Laki was still alive, the 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 Al Qaeda mastermind who was a uh, an imam in the capital and uh, very influential in the United States for a while, uh, a lot of people said, "You see, he's not really a Muslim because he was busted trying to uh, uh, get together with prostitutes." Now the thing is, though, I don't think people realized when they were upbraiding him for that that there's nothing as far as Islam goes. You know, he could. Say he married her for for the weekend and big deal, no problem. Mm -hmm. Pretty standard. Also, we have here from Urban Infidel. Hey, Irby, do they realize that virginhood is only a temporary state? What happens to the virgins once they are no longer virgins? What do you think, David? Oh. What happens? Oh, it's it's no mystery. Uh, you can easily uh, read the commentaries um, on this issue, but uh, according to uh, according to Orthodox Islam. Allah restores the virginity of the virgin after you have sex with her. So you have your virgin, you have sex with her. She is no longer a virgin, but then overnight, Allah will miraculously restore her virginity. So he's going to restore her hymen so that every time you have sex with her, she's a virgin over and over again. So, I mean, just notice the kind of people that this appeals to. It's people who are obsessed with deflowering virgins so yeah just to be clear he does not continue just making tons and tons of of new virgins he takes the same women you've been having sex with well girls you've been having sex with and uh keeps turning them back into virgins and you know what is a commonality um, on among uh a, a commonality between that and many many other things in islam david is the love of pain islam really loves to inflict pain you, you think about, for example, um, the, the slaughter of the animals, halal slaughter. You can't stun the animal first. You can't do it quickly. You have to, to slice the neck and the blood all bleeds out. The, the animal suffers a great deal in that. And the, the whole idea of virginity and blood and pain, it's all mixed up. Once again, it seems as if Allah loves torturing people. Um, and I'm sure you've read the New York Times article. Uh, I went through I went through the entire thing in a live the entire article in a live stream uh, a couple of days ago, but they were torturing uh, Israeli women while raping them and gang raping them. So uh, one of the one of them were uh, uh, he was uh, raping the girl from behind, and every time she would uh, resist, he would stab her in the back. Um, there was another girl that while she's being raped, a man, uh, one of the jihadis cuts off her breast and then they start playing with it. Uh, there's another, there was another woman that they found dozens of nails uh, that were, uh, I'm assuming they were using a nail gun that were shot into her uh, thighs and pelvic region. So this is, this is how they're tr treating uh, women and girls that they're raping but it, it kind of ties in they want mm -hmm. this to be a horrible painful experience to you they don't want yeah you know, and so they want it to be as horrible and painful as possible and you look and that's what they want for all eternity they want to be mm -hmm. taking girls virginity forever and and david you know i tell you i think that the uh 
blood and pain aspect of this, there is a lot to it. That uh, it's one of the hardest things that non-Muslims have, uh, uh, non-Muslims find to try to, why am I so inarticulate tonight? Excuse me, David, let's try this again. It's one of the hardest old. things for non-Muslims to, yep, you're right. It's one of the <laughs> hardest things for non-Muslims to understand that, and I, I, I can think of like, you know, 20, 30 years now, I've been asked this innumerable times. How can these people think they're serving God and do these terrible things? And the thing that they don't understand is, is that that's what their God told them to do. And so the terrible things are like sacramental holy acts. To, to, if, if, if Allah tells you strike terror in the enemies of Allah, then if you are stabbing women while you're raping them and things like that, that strikes her terror in, in her heart. And so that is a holy, righteous act that is pleasing to Allah. Now, what does that make a law? That's, that's, that's another question. But this is not something that people think is, uh, is, is contrary to their religion. They think that it is basic to their religion. And I see people saying in these comments that uh, it is demonic. And I think, yeah, that's true. Also, let's yeah, deal with this uh, one more time, yeah. David. I know that this comes up fairly often these days, but one more time. Um, I do not, not take donations. I'm happy to take donations and they are indeed gratefully received. You can donate via Patreon or Jihad Watch. Uh, it is not that I don't take donations. It is that YouTube thinks that it's so terrible to oppose Jihad that they had long ago demonetized this, uh, YouTube channel. Consequently, I can't do... Uh, super chats and can't take donations that way. But if you could find it into your heart to uh, support me or Jihad Watch, you can find the links on the jihadwatch.org site. Uh, and yeah. I'm not so rich or rich at all. Just trying to hold on and keep doing this to keep getting the truth out. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to point out uh, to everyone uh, that they can click on the description box and they've got a link to uh, Robert's Patreon there, also to Jihad Watch. So uh, this this show that we that we uh, do as many uh, as much as we can um, uh, is basically a condensed version of the material that Robert covers on his website. So if you want to stay up to date there, but he, Robert also has uh, links to his books on Amazon. The History of Jihad, The Critical Quran, and The Palestinian Delusion. So those are the three most relevant for things we cover here. And so, yeah, uh, you can support Robert in multiple ways by grabbing his books. Uh, but yeah, if you can, become a Patreon, everyone. Thank Let you very much. A... Thank you very much, sir. And so uh, let's get right to it. I think, I guess, the biggest story coming out of the Christmas season is, of course, the terrible massacre in Nigeria, where on uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day... Uh, the death toll keeps rising, but it appears to be to around 200 Christians were murdered, uh, many in the church as they were worshiping on Christmas Day. And this is just part of the larger jihad in Nigeria that has killed 52,000 Christians in over a decade and forced millions to leave their homes. And uh, as as despicable as that, and yeah, so this is uh, this is kind of the tip of the iceberg as far as what's going on in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But uh, as awful as the jihad against Christians is in Nigeria, the ethnic cleansing, dare we say it, the uh, genocide of Nigerian Christians, it was very heartwarming to see so many intelligent, well-informed students on college campuses around the world protesting this genocide of Christians. Yes. Oh, wait. Yes. Oh, oh, wait. I forgot there wasn't one single person protesting this. They were because no Jews were involved. No and Jews, because it was, no news. And because it's Muslims doing the uh, the genocide and uh, and not someone else. Yeah, we have to understand that the media is not really a news source. The media is a propaganda outfit for various uh, powerful entities. We don't need to get into who they are, and I don't even know entirely, I don't think anybody does, but the fact is that the media has a narrative, and if your news fits the narrative, 
then it will go around the world. But if it doesn't, it will die on the vine. And so what we got in terms of Nigeria is, a, some, is something that does not fit the narrative. The narrative always for the media is that Christians are white oppressors and Muslims are brown victims. And so in Nigeria, you have everybody's brown who's involved and the Muslims are the oppressors and the Christians are the victims doesn't fit. So it throws out. Any story that doesn't fit that narrative will not get reported widely in the West. And this is a, this is, this problem with the media and with governments and, and everyone else, I mean, this is really bad because if no one is draws attention to this, Islam is going to keep exterminating Christians and, uh, and everyone who's not Muslim in Africa. So Islam dominates Northern Africa. They are, they are pushing southward and who's in their way, bunch of Christians and some other groups. And they're going to keep doing that. And they're going to keep waging genocide. They're going to keep uh, uh, ethnically cleansing entire populations. And the world wasn't the world. The entire world will not care because it doesn't fit a narrative. That's insane. Absolute Indeed. insanity. I can tell you uh, another aspect of this Nigeria story, David, that's very interesting that I had not seen before very often. And that is that as thousands of people were fleeing various villages and towns because of the jihad massacre on christmas day in nigeria christmas eve and christmas day and then the jihadis occupied those houses that they had fled and this reminded me of things that i heard from from lebanese christians uh that during the lebanese civil war uh, i knew some people who they said that at one point the uh hezbollah or other Muslim militias came to their neighborhood, Christian area, and said, uh, there's going to be a uh, uh, battle here. You better get out. And they got out. And then uh, the when they went back, there were Muslims who'd moved into their houses. Now, it seems to me this is one of the ways that the jihad advances around the world, that you get these uh, people who flee their homes, the jihadis take their homes. That's the whole idea, is it not, sir? Yeah, Robert. Uh, did you say Lebanon? I did. I did say Lebanon. I have to. I have to admit, I said Lebanon. What, wasn't wasn't Lebanon a majority Christian country like a century ago? It was, and there was a concerted effort on the part of the Islamic Republic of Iran, starting as recently as 1979, to move Shiite Muslims into Lebanon. And now there is a very significant Shiite population, if not a majority, certainly a Muslim majority. And the Shiites uh, have, are, were responsible for the displacement of the Christians to which I was referring. But the Sunnis were in on it as well in other areas. So, so ju just to be clear, you had a majority Christian uh, place where you don't anymore. It's majority Muslim. Where, where are the college uh, protests over that sort of thing? Because that sort of thing has been going on for centuries, and that's exactly what's going to be going on uh, in Africa, although probably much, I mean, as you can see, it's, it's much more violent. And no one cares. As long as Christians are on the receiving end and Muslims are on the giving end of the jihad, the world just does not care even slightly. Toss a toss a Jew into the mix of someone who's uh, who's who's fighting, um, and toss a Muslim on the receiving end, uh, someone who's being fought, and then all of a sudden people perk up. They perk up quite a bit. It becomes newsworthy. Indeed, but here again, it's the narrative. It's all about the narrative. The narrative is that. Muslims are the victims, and they are the racial victim group, and the Christians are white, the, the, the oppressor group, and they are always the oppressors. So in Lebanon, just as in Nigeria, the news doesn't fit the narrative, it doesn't get reported. I would expect most people have no idea that Lebanon, modern Lebanon, was actually envisioned as a homeland for Christians in the Middle East, and now it is almost completely taken over there's still a significant Christian population there, but it is a minority now, and it's on its way out. Yeah, and you would, it would kind of make sense. Uh, it would kind of make sense. See, see, in the West, we have this mindset of, hey, we can all we can all get along. Uh, you know, in other parts of the world, 
people kind of need a place to have as their own when Islam is involved, because Islam will slowly, uh, slowly or quickly uh, wipe you out and, and completely take over. So it would seem like in a, in a dangerous place like the Middle East, there would need to be a place where Jews can defend themselves and where Christians can defend themselves and so on. And so, well, Christians kind of had that at one point and not anymore. That was the idea. But the Christians, of course, because uh, they were infused with Western ideas, they were welcoming of uh, others. They thought it was their responsibility to be thus welcoming. And then, of course, the Islamic Republic of Iran exploited that. And well, here we are. All right, let's move on to what's happening in Europe because it's the same thing. And we have here this gentleman. Uh, I don't know if you know him. That is, uh, I, I feel silly saying this guy's name. This is a TikTok star, David, and he calls himself Breezy Derdon El Jefe. Nice. Breezy, which is English, Der, with the, the German definite article. The German. And then Don El Jefe, Spanish. That's like bo that's boss or something, right? Like boss. Yeah, he is breezy. Yeah, breezy, the 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 boss, the chief, breezy der Don El Jefe. Uh, so he's an idiot, in other words. But um, we we no, I I love this guy. But in any case, he is a TikTok star, and he recently did a TikTok video while he was on vacation in Tenerife, in Spain. Uh, and he has 50,000 followers on TikTok. His uh, videos get six figures in views. And in this video, he's Breezy Derdan El Jefe. He says, uh, the Germans will experience their blue miracle. I don't know why it's blue. I thought it was green. But anyway, he says, we will take their West. And when we're done with Germany, Austria will come next. You Germans behave yourselves. Otherwise, I'll just say one word, mustard gas. I guess that's one word in German, but it ain't in English. Uh, we will make sure that Germany goes down the drain. There are so many of us here already. And after Germany, as he said, it's Austria's turn. Soon, we will bring Sharia law to Germany. Uh, at, least he, at least he's honest. Yeah, he said it. Uh, soon, we will bring Sharia law to Germany. And Breezy Der Don El Jefe will be the Chancellor of Germany. Uh, it could happen, because after all, the Germans, they, uh, they think that it would be terrible to do anything to stop this kind of thing. But at least, yeah, he's very open about his plans, whereas others are not so. Although I think that's changing in the West, is it not, David? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> the weird thing is, it's like, Given the, you know, given the 20th century and, and things that went on with Germany, it's like, how far do you want to push these German guys before you think they're going to... See, it's, it's an interesting situation because you've got, like, you've got Great Britain and you've got Western nations and they're so, they're so guilty over, you know, the age of colonialism and so on that they think, ah, uh, in order to atone from... You know what we did over there in this other part of the world or something like that we have to be as stupid as possible and commit cultural suicide it's the only way to fix anything as if being as stupid and self-destructive as possible right now somehow fixes something you didn't like the fact that you did in the past or something like that but notice that's like you know that's uh you know places like great britain thinking about colonialism the germans did the holocaust so their guilt is like way way up there how do we fix the what we did to jews i know let's bring in as many people as possible who want to kill jews <laughs> that's going to fix that so there's like it's it's like really stupid you think that you think that you know germans would be smarter than that but at the end of the day i mean these are the same people i mean talking about the germans these are the same people who just rise up every once in a while and take on the entire world yeah. and do shockingly better than anyone would expect them to do taking on the entire world so I don't know. On the one hand, they're 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 trying to, you know, they're bending over backwards and just, you know, please, sir, beat me again. Beat me again. Oh, I'll show you. I'll show you that I, I, I don't approve of the Holocaust by letting, you know, jihadis treat me this way. Uh, but you th I don't know. Just I'm guessing there's going to come a point when I say, ah, OK, as 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 terrible as I feel from the Holocaust, I'm not letting these guys rape my daughter. I'm just not. And uh, this all ends now. 
just wonder how how many people have to suffer horribly before uh, the Germans get some balls. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I I don't think they will. I think that they've been taught. I mean, of course, I think that needs to be emphasized. Neither of us are saying that anybody should be killed in Germany. Uh, I still I, I still don't believe I still don't believe anyone has to. I believe if you just quit protecting it from criticism, I think problems I think the problems go away very, very quickly. I think Islam would absolutely implode if you didn't have politicians and journalists and the entire education system and the entire entertainment industry and the entire UN constantly protecting it. If you if you just stop that, we're not talking about killing anyone. Stop protecting it from criticism. I think it I think it implodes. There will still be Muslim, there will still be plenty of Muslims. I think it will be weakened enough to where it's it's you don't have to worry about it taking over. And the thing is also maybe give police protection to people who want to leave and then there would be multitudes who would want to leave uh, if they thought that they would be safe doing so. But the thing is, it, it, the Germans have been taught for so many decades now that uh, having even a German identity is wrong and leads to genocide and so on. That uh, I don't know. I, I, they might be on their way out, but I suppose we will see soon enough. And I have to say, if they do fall... To Islam, yes, better them than us. Better them than us. Well, I I think that if they do fall to Islam, then it's the implications for us are pretty dire. Well, I, I'd have to say you wonder you wonder because uh, <laughs> you're familiar with the history of jihad. You literally wrote the book on the history of jihad. You're familiar with what happened over 14 centuries. Now we're seeing it in our lifetimes happening in Europe, the same thing that happened in other areas of the world in previous centuries. And everyone's, no, 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 it, it'll work here. It'll be fine here. And so, okay, once uh, if Islam takes over a place like France and Germany, and then you see what happens as the entire, as entire nations are burned to the ground and uh, Sharia is enforced, you just wonder, are, are, are we still gonna be sitting there going, oh, but you know, it'll be fine here. It's never fine anywhere else in the world, but it'll be fine here. It'll work here. Yeah, I think people will still be saying that. Nobody's learned any lessons of history. They don't even know what the history is. Uh, anyway, speaking of things that keep on happening and nobody ever catches on, there's a terrific story this week that uh, I came across, and it it goes back years, David. This is not just a this week in jihad. This is this seven years in jihad, uh, because this is in the first place. Let me get the uh, details here. Whoops. Sorry, had the wrong link. I tell you, I, I, I need a secretary, David. Anyway, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. we all do. <laughs> back in 2015, this is a Palestinian girl, uh, 14 years old, named Sabrine Mujahid Sanad, and she was arrested for carrying a knife in Israel, and those are IDF soldiers around her, and that was, uh, once again, 2015, Sabrine Mujahid Sanad, okay? You got that? Now, hold that thought. 2016, there was a girl named Salwa Takakta, and she was a Palestinian girl who was arrested for carrying a knife, and these are the IDF soldiers around her, and this was the picture that went out saying, this is Salwa Takakta, and nobody said, wait a minute, that's Sabrine Mujahid Sanad. It was the same picture. The next year, 2017, a girl named Manar Shweki was arrested in Israel for carrying a knife. And these are the IDF soldiers around her. And this was the picture given of Manar Shweki. And then in 2018, there was a girl who was arrested for carrying a knife in Israel. And her name was Tasnim Basem Matuk. And that's her. That was the picture that went out for the arrest 
that when she was uh, found with a knife, and then just last week, a Palestinian lawyer named Case Siddiqui, he published a picture of what he said was a young Palestinian girl under the care of Israel. And this is the picture he put up on Twitter, X, whatever. And uh, there are several other examples. I wrote an article about this this week of uh, this picture being used for seven years now. Uh, she apparently has at least six identities. And well, this it was not a stock photo. Uh, the picture was accompanied by a caption saying, this is Menar Shwekis and so on. And so it was very clearly meant to indicate that this was somebody who was being arrested at this time. But it's not possible that she could have been all six of these people, is it, David? Or, or is there some well, gin involved? Well, I mean, as you're as you keep sharing uh, pictures of all these women, I'm just, you know, I'm trying not to sound racist, but there's all these ladies kind of look alike to me. Really? You think? Yeah, you know, you got a point and they're dressed the same and. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, exactly. Standing. Like, how can you even distinguish between all these different girls? It's amazing. But in any case, uh, war is deceit, said Muhammad. And uh, it's important to note that this war is deceit business is taken to heart by Islamic jihadis. It's very important not to take what you hear from uh, pro-jihad sources at take, the, take it at face value because there's so much deception. Uh, nonetheless, in the West, pretty much all the time, it is taken for granted as being axiomatically true. Uh, David, how about we skip over to Detroit for an interesting incident that happened uh, at the 13th Congressional District Congressional Democrats Christmas Party right before Christmas. Uh, the Democrats are there, gathered there in Detroit to have uh, this Christmas party, and the Palestinian youth movement showed up and started banging on the windows and stormed into the bar, disrupting the event. They were repeatedly asked to leave but refused and started physically confronting and shoving and pushing the party attendees. A Democrat Party activist named Bobby Johnson was punched in the face, hospitalized with two black eyes. And she said, they came in here, they bust me in my head. And so uh, the, another one of the activists, the, the Democrat activists who also sustained two black eyes, said, them Arabs in Detroit tried to kill me. And I thought, well, this is interesting because this is, once again, the left Islamic alliance breaking down this time over Israel. What do you think? Um, yeah, but they've got so much that unites them. There's uh, <laughs> hatred of Jews and uh, hatred of the West. Um, so they've, so they've, they've got they sh they share that. Uh, no, a couple. I mean. I'm, I'm just thinking two things. One, it's always after every terrorist attack, and there were, there have been, what, like 40,000 Islamic terrorist attacks just since 9-11? Yep. Um, after every terrorist attack, that, the vast majority of them don't make it into the news, except on your site, uh, but uh, and on religionofpeace.com. But uh, after everyone that actually makes it into the news, we're told, uh, hey, you can't bring this up to anyone else in the world. You can't say it has anything to do with Islam or uh, ask anyone else about it or or even be slightly concerned about this anywhere else in the world. What you definitely don't ever want to do is blame any other Muslim or cause any problems for any other Muslim other than the one who's not even real Muslim because he's, he's launching a terrorist attack. He's not even a real Muslim because uh, Islam's a religion of peace. But uh, you can't there, there, you can't you, you can't apply any you, you can't apply any of this to anyone else in the world. These same people who tell us that are for decades, for decades, don't associate what happens here with anyone else in the world. Suddenly, when it's Jews, ah, look, we're really mad at the Jews. Therefore, we will go after everyone else in the entire world who's even loosely remotely connected to to Israel or Jews 
in any way. Um, in fact, if, if you are if you are not actively destroying Israel, everyone's just, we, we all have to come after you. We all have to come after you. You can't you can't have you can't have a Christmas. You can't have anything like that. But I mean, notice if there was a terrorist attack, we said, ah, we're going to go disrupt everyone's Ramadan services. This would be treated as like the most evil racist thing in the world, um, but yeah. perfectly acceptable uh, for them. So that's that's one thing. And then the, the other thing in response to that is it's it's kind of amusing in a sense that Israel just keeps going after Hamas in spite of uh, the antics around the world. So people mm-hmm. are going around with uh, with all their uh, with all their great showmanship on all their college campuses. And, hey, we're going to go harass everyone around the world. We're going to just keep harassing people. We're going to harass Christians. We're going to harass uh, we're going to harass Democrats. We're going to harass Republicans. We're going to harass everyone. And Israel's still going after Hamas. And that's just cool that even though everyone else in the world is is worried about all these morons on campuses and so on, Israel says, eh, we're still going after Hamas. Cry all you want. Indeed. And so, yeah, the uh, coalition is still strong in terms of hating Jews, but the left base, as, as we see in this disruption of the Christmas party, is enraged that the Democrat Party establishment and the Biden administration has not thrown Israel under the bus. And so they're trying to pressure it to do that. And it, it would, it would, by the way, it would be it would be really rough for the political left to throw Israel under the bus because you have lots of Jews who, especially lots of Jewish donors who are on the political left. And you wonder is that is that go, is that part of the alliance at least going to break down? I mean, are, are are people going to wake? Are Jews in the West going to wake up and say, "Oh my goodness, look at what's going on here. Maybe we are." Maybe we shouldn't be financially supporting all these politicians and all these schools when they're actively supporting all the people who want to completely exterminate us. Indeed, I hope so. But a lot of people, you know, as the as the uh, great movie classic, Cool Hand Luke, the man with no eyes. No, it wasn't the man with no eyes. It was the uh, the warden says, you know, some men you just can't reach. And so I think that uh, we got, unfortunately, quite a few of them in the world today. And here's another. This is Gerald Darmanin, the interior minister of France. You can tell he's French by the expression on his face there. That's how all French people look. I don't mean like that. I mean, the, I mean, the actual face he's making. <laughs> well, he's he's pronouncing French when he when he looks like that. So that's just what French does to you. But in any case, he he had good news for us. He said that the start of 2024 has been calm. He said New Year's Eve was great. It was calm. Only 745 vehicles were torched. Only 745. This is down from, you know, 1,000, 1,200 and uh, others in other years. So uh, the jihad is over in France. Am I right, David? Yeah, and that's kind of what that's kind of what's funny is in a weird way I agree with that cheese gobbling weirdo, right? And there's a there's a part of me who's like, okay, given given all given how everyone's riled up, and because you've got so many Dawa guys that are panicking over the what they call the avalanche of apostasy and how they think that uh, you know they have to rise up right now or Islam is going to be so weak in the future that they're not going to be able to, so they think it's like right now. I actually was expecting things to be much worse this uh, holiday than in previous holidays and so on. And so, yeah, I, I agree with him. Only set, what'd you say, 700 and how many cars? 745. That was it. Yeah, that's, see, that, now that, that's good. Maybe they're all tuckered out from burning entire cities to the ground a few months back. Um, remember that? Remember they were burning all the cities? Maybe they're all tuckered out. Well, there were a few, there were a few other jihadis in France this week. Uh, we had this charming guy. Uh, let me see if we have details about this guy. Uh, he was in uh, in Cannes, where they have the film festival, and uh, he starts following this woman, and instead, but as she's going up the stairs of this building, he's following her, and she go, she actually steps aside to let him pass, but instead, he grabs her by the collar and shouts. Show me your breasts. Now, why would somebody say that to a stranger on the street or in an, in some apartment building, David? What would be the assumptions behind that? Uh, I have no idea. But if, if we know anything, Robert, it's that 
Women are like lollipops. <laughs> and if the lollipop is wrapped up, the ants will stay off of it. But if it's unwrapped, then the ants will come and eat the lollipop. So this woman and, was not wearing the cab. She was unwrapped. So he figured, well, this is a whore. He doesn't have any hesitation to uh, treat her in this way. And so he starts to, he throws her, throws her to the ground when she refused, starts kicking her, uh, says that he kicked her so much his sneakers were stained with her blood, and she testified in court there was pleasure in his eyes. So here again we see this pain. They, they love pain. They love inflicting pain, jihadis, because this is something Allah said, strike terror in the enemies of Allah. So there you go. Yep. Allah sure does love sadism. Indeed. And so also in France, in uh, some other place that looks like Hots de Seine, but I'm sure it's Eau de Seine or something like that. Anyway. So stupid. Something stupid. <laughs> <laughs> They all, it's funny french people they all sound like they all sound like uh, they all sound like they have a mouthful of cheese but they, they normally do i don't know anyway so uh the guy uh he is in class this is a kid in school and the teacher is teaching about islamic jihad attacks and i think what what the heck who is this teacher do they have Kurt Wilders as a substitute teacher in 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 Eau de Seine? I don't understand this, but in any case, somebody's act, some teacher in France is actually teaching about jihad attacks, and the uh, student gets angry and says, you are more like Samuel Paty, who was, of course, the Ooh. teacher who showed a Muhammad cartoon and was beheaded on the street for it in the course of, he showed it in the course of a, a lesson about freedom of speech, so... He threat this kid threatens to murder the teacher for teaching about jihad attacks. Seems to me the definition of blasphemy is getting a little wider. Yeah, and we mentioned this in a previous episode where it was where we saw that uh I mean teachers in France you, you could just teach something that they disagree with and they'll start accusing you of blasphemy, and the teachers are actually like the, they have to get out of there they have to stop because you don't know who's gonna simply the rumor that you've committed blasphemy can be enough right so it, it's just i mean think about how messed up that situation is you don't like a teacher uh you want that teacher replaced by you know a muslim or something like that or you just want that teacher you want a teacher that you can completely control any teacher you don't like ah oh, this teacher's committing blasphemy ah, this teacher spoke about muhammad it's the same thing that we see in pakistan although it's it's kind of you know it's it's getting started in france but it's the same idea it's the same idea we can control you through mob violence and uh man you just wonder it's, it's weird i think okay when are the french going to stand up for themselves but you know, unlike the Germans, I, I think the Germans might. I don't think the French will. Uh, well, we I think we could probably agree that the British certainly will not. Uh, but in any case, maybe that's another story. Uh, speaking of Germany, I got another German. The British, story the here. British will. The British will. You Robert. think so? I, I am part. I am part of a secret mission. We are going to uh, go. We're going to dig up Winston Churchill. We're going to clone him. We're going to clone okay. him. Okay. We're going to grow. I'm going to grow my own Winston Churchill, send him over there. They'll probably, you know, the the, the population will probably uh, stone him to death right now. But um, yes, uh, I'm going to clone an entire army of Winston Churchill. Wait a minute, David, you have to do it there, because if you bring him over here and do it here, they won't let him back into the country. He'll be banned oh, yeah, from that's the what, country. Yeah, that's what they did to you. Darn. Yeah. So uh, no chance. Uh, interesting story out of Germany anyway. Um in the uh this is right out of the german press uh translated on jihad watch exclusive translation we have uh, the guy uh is is 15 years old okay this is a 15 year old kid and he takes his girlfriend out into the forest and then strangles her and he goes back 
to the cops and says, I killed my girlfriend, although she was found to be still alive and is now in the hospital fighting for her life. But this guy who killed, who said he killed his girlfriend, strangled his girlfriend, he is the son of another guy who stabbed his seven-year-old daughter and said he did it in the name of Allah. He said he had been studying religion and the Quran intensively. And he said, at some point it became clear that I had to sacrifice one of my children for Allah. Now, sacrificing human beings is not actually part of Islam. But where might he have gotten in the Quran, David, such an idea that killing a child might be a meritorious act? I'll go with Surah 18 as a guess. Surah 18 is just what I was thinking. I think you've won, won the This Week in Jihad prize for this week. What's in Surah 18 for the for our viewing audience, David? Yeah, you have, uh, you have the story of... Uh... Moses walking around with a guy, and that guy uh, guy kills a kid, and um, and it turns out because that kid was going to grow up and uh, dishonor his parents in some way, and therefore a uh, guy killed him preemptively. And uh, you can read the you can read the Muslim commentators if if you actually if you were somehow to actually know, like if you were had prophetic abilities and you were to know that someone is going to uh, cause problems for his parents in the future, yeah, you could you could definitely kill him. Indeed. And so it may be that he killed his daughter in that way, but I thought it's interesting. We now have two generations, the father and the son, and they both have committed brutal acts of violence against women. And you've got to wonder if that has any connection to the Quran's sanction for the uh, striking of disobedient women. Of course, it doesn't say you can kill them, but once you can strike them, accidents can happen. As well as, of course, what you've pointed out many occasions, that if you are dealing with a disobedient woman, she may have made herself a disbeliever, and then you can kill her. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we got quite a lot of stupid infidels. For example, there was a jihad plot. David's gone. Is David gone? Yikes. Where'd he go? Ah. Well, ladies and gentlemen... Uh, as I was saying, the uh, it's awful curious. I hope I didn't disconnect him anyway. Um, maybe he'll come back. In any case, in Cologne in Germany, there was a plot to uh, blow up or commit a jihad massacre, not necessarily blow the place up, the Cologne Cathedral. And there were so it was uh, stopped in time. There were several... Uh, jihadis arrested and what's interesting is that three of them were released the next day they were in prison overnight and that was that it was not something that uh, kept them in prison for very long time at all so anyway uh ladies and gentlemen huh, let's see what else we can do here while we hope that david comes back what we have is, yeah, it's the djinn. Maybe the djinn got him. Um, what we have here is Oriana Filol, who is in France, and she is the deputy mayor for uh, Saint-Denis, which is the very Muslim area of uh, Paris. And she is a champion of mass Muslim migration. But she was recently assaulted by several Muslim migrants hit violently in the face and the body with punches. Oriana Filol. And so uh, it's unclear as to the, at this point whether she will revise her views of these issues. I would expect not. You know, I, would, I, I think that some, as I said before, some men you just can't reach. Some people... They just don't uh, learn from experience. And so not learning from experience means that they end up repeating the same mistakes again and again and again. Yeah, maybe it was prayer time. We have somebody saying here, uh, whoops, um, maybe David went to pray. <laughs> All right, let's see what else we got here. 
Um, there was an interesting incident this week with this young lady, I think young lady, who is one of those TikTok converts to Islam and who then made a video uh, saying that, uh, expressing a little bit of disappointment and saying that uh, she had been disappointed to find that so many things were forbidden in Islam. And I think that uh, this is a manifestation of the fact that there is such a disconnect between how Islam is presented to people when they are being courted to convert and then how it ends up being in real life when they actually get in. And so she was surprised by what she encountered. Although when I posted about this at Jihad Watch, she did an angry video follow-up uh, saying she was not leaving Islam. She loved Islam. It's wonderful. And she's just, take, just taking a little getting used to. So good luck with that. Uh, she may be in for many more surprises. I think that that is unfortunately quite likely. Um, all right. So what else we got? We got Uganda. We have not uh, spoken about Uganda this week, but as David has noted in the past, there are many areas where the jihad is advancing in Africa. The idea is ultimately to establish a caliphate in Africa and then expand it, of course, elsewhere. This, this, is, this effort is well underway. They're doing uh, very well in Nigeria and very well in uh, East Africa as well. The French, as a matter of fact, were countering them, but have actually pulled out now or are in the process of doing so. And so it's likely that uh, we are going to see caliphates in Nigeria. And so in Nigeria, and I'm sorry, caliphates in Nigeria, as well as in East Africa. And so the stories that come out of these places are nothing short of horrific. And in Uganda... Recently, we had, um, let me see, this is, oh, a story that I don't have a picture for, I was looking for a picture, sorry folks, a little discombobulated here. Uh, the Uganda story is this, right before Christmas, they showed up around 2 a.m. in a Christian area. Islamic jihadis from the Allied Democratic Forces, which despite its name is indeed a jihad group allied with the Islamic State. And they said the Christians will not celebrate the birth of Isa, that is Jesus. Uh, that's as, what he's called in the Quran. And we have to teach a lesson to these infidels for refusing our religion. And 10 Christians were killed in that attack in Uganda. Uh, then there was a an elderly woman, and her name was, let's see, Sawuba Nagaga. I do have a picture of her. It's a very sad picture. This is Sawuba Nagaga from uh, uh, Uganda, and she was a Muslim woman who converted to Christianity. And uh, while her son was away for four months working in Saudi Arabia, and so when he came back, he noticed that she was praying Christian prayers and not Islamic prayers. And so uh, she said this when she was seriously injured. She was still, still alive and conscious. She said, my son, as I was praying with my eyes closed, my son called me saying, Mom, Mom, you are becoming a disgrace to the family and the religion of Allah. I kept quiet, and he pushed me hard to the wall, and then I fell down. He took a blunt object and hit me in the head. Anyway, uh, she died shortly thereafter, but uh, looks like we may have David back working on it here. There he is. Yo. Good evening. Yeah, that's uh, we, we've talked about this. Yeah, we've talked about this before. There's a for some reason, as soon as I upgraded with uh, upgraded Chrome on that computer, 
Ecamm is uh, is glitchy. Only not when I'm running it. Only when someone only when when someone else is uh, sending me the link. Anyway, I don't know what that is, but uh, it is a problem. They send you a, a link for troubleshooting, and I trouble I troubleshot it before, and it worked. But now it doesn't even work with the troubleshooting. So I might just have to start using my laptop. Well, we could always move this back to your channel. No, you got to have it, man. Okay. Uh, anyway. I was just talking about Uganda, and uh, Uganda, there was a killing of 10 Christians, and I thought it was interesting, David, you might be interested in commenting on this, as the attackers were killing 10 Christians, this was right before Christmas, they said, the Christians will not celebrate the birth of Isa, we have to teach a lesson to these infidels for refusing our religion. Surely there's no uh, justification in Islam for such a thing, is there? Well, I I always get a little confused. Like, uh, I, you know, I get them flipping out and saying, ah, 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 Christmas is worse than murder and stuff like that, uh, given our beliefs about Jesus. But my goodness, they believe in a miraculous birth of Jesus as well. So how much should they really be complaining there? I don't know. Well, but I what think were you that thinking? Uh, I was thinking actually of Sahih Muslim, uh, where Muhammad says, you first, when you meet the unbelievers, you first invite them to accept Islam. If they refuse, mm -hmm. you invite them to pay the jizya. And if they refuse that, then seek Allah's help and fight mm -hmm. them. And so if yep. they refuse the religion, it's a kind of license to fight them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's entirely correct. I just, I just, why, why do they flip out uh, Christmas so much? Well, Christmas because, of course, the one who is to be born is the Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Uh, in, it's interesting to track uh, how the Christmas story is cribbed from the gospel, in, the gospels in the Quran, with the very careful omission of anything like that. It's just a, the mm -hmm. birth of a of a prophet. Oh yeah, and you can even see we we know where the uh, Islamic narratives come from, and if you read them parallel, if you read them side by side with the Quran, in other words, you read. The uh, the source that Muhammad is plagiarizing beside be, be, uh, beside the Quran. Um, if you read them side by side, he just changes everything that has a reference to Jesus' uh, deity and so on, and just changes it to "I'm a servant of Allah." And uh, yeah, it's interesting. Indeed. Uh, meanwhile, David, we're coming up to the end of the hour, and so I thought that I should note that uh, MSNBC wants us to know that uh, after 9-11, ignorant Islamophobic hate erased and contradicted the core teachings of peace at the center of Islam. Yeah, we did that. <laughs> We're the ones who did that. Shame on us. You know you did that, Robert. You built a yeah. time machine. You built a time machine. Uh, fueled by 1.21 gigawatts of uh, Islamophobia. You went back to the 7th century and you filled uh, all the Muslim sources with all this stuff. It's true. It's true. It can now be revealed 22 years after 9-11. Uh, it, it, it's, it's just amazing to me. You know, um, as a matter of fact, there was this... Uh, it, I'm just speechless with the with the incredible chutzpah of it but i got a message earlier today saying that i've been lying about islam from for all these years and i thought everything that i've been saying about islam for all these years has been completely vindicated mm -hmm. correct it's it's all been shown to be true at this point and so mm -hmm. to say at this late date that i've been lying about islam really is asking for a very high level of ignorance on the part of one's audience yeah, and uh, we we've talked about this recently as as well. In that, for the past twenty years, you've been saying, "Hey, Islam calls for jihad and uh, killing apostates and you know beating women into submission." And so you're called a liar every step of the way. And now the Dawa guys all shout this from the rooftops. They all say, "Of course we're going to kill apostates. Of course we're going to subjugate the world. Of course we beat. Women. Of course we're going to do all this stuff. It's obvious. What's wrong with you?" And they'll even say, "I mean, you." You were uh, you were all 
the show where the, the Muslim Dawah guys, so Jake, the Muslim metaphysician, and Daniel Hill Kikaju, um, both acknowledged, I mean, they were asked about Rashid, since he's an apostate, would you kill him? And the answer was yes, and yeah. people who are guilty of blasphemy, which would be you. Yep. So so they're acknowledging this. What's amazing is they'll still call you an Islamophobe. It's like, and oh, you don't want you don't want to be you don't want to be killed therefore every even though everything you're saying is completely correct the fact that you do not want to be killed and subjugated means that you're an islamophobe and a liar even though you're saying everything we're saying yeah it's really amazing coming from those guys because they everything they say about islam i say yeah that's that's what islam's all about and that's mm -hmm. what i've been saying islam is all about from the 90s to now and they still say you're a liar it's 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 incredible to me, but of course, it's a culture of lies, yeah. and they are of their father, who is the father of lies. And so we'll end up with this one last, yeah, before I go oh, to the no, last I just, thing. I just wanted to say, I mean, how absolutely insane that is. We should actually run repeatable experiments on this. Have a Muslim say, of course we're going to kill apostates. And then you, five minutes later, go, Islam says kill apostates. When the when the, the Muslim leader says, of course, we're going to kill apostates, watch the Muslims cheer. Oh, alhamdulillah, of course, we're going to kill the apostates. Finally, someone is telling the truth. And then five minutes later, you say it. Hey, Islam says you kill apostates. Watch. Liar! Liar! How dare you lie about our religion? Look at the Islamophobia. It's, I mean, it's, I, mean I don't Often know. Often the same like, people. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, exactly the same people. And I, I would, you would think that psychology would be interested in this, like studying this, like, how can this guy say one thing? This guy will say the same thing. They'll cheer for this guy and they'll condemn and want to kill this other guy. It's amazing. It's a it's a high level of tribalism such that uh, I think most people in the West don't have any idea how to deal with. All right, one last uh, story here. Oh, that's the wrong one. Hang on. No, it's the same one. Same part, just it's a different person. It's yeah, the exact same picture. I keep uh, hitting the wrong button here. Where is she? I thought I... Oh, here she is. This is... Uh, let me get her name. That was the same girl. I knew it. Aya Abu Hajjaj. And she was murdered walking her children to school. Hmm. And uh, there was a very large Palestinian account on Twitter X that said she was stabbed to death by a Zionist settler. That was November 30th. But as it turned out... She was actually killed by her 14-year-old brother, her 15-year-old cousin, and her 51-year-old father. And this was indeed an honor killing by the father and the brother. Same kind of thing that we were talking about before. Justified in Quran chapter 18. And once again, I mean, lied about entirely in terms of the circumstances. Yeah, when you brought when you brought it up and you said this woman was killed, I was the first thing that popped into my head was, uh, "Why haven't I? Uh, why haven't I heard about this? Why haven't I heard about this?" Uh, the answer is, if she had been killed by a Jew, I would have heard about it all day, every day, for a long time. Uh, but it wasn't. It was uh, she was killed by her her Muslim family, and therefore completely irrelevant. Doesn't fit the narrative. And so we hope that you will have a narrative-free week, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I've got some travels coming up, but I think we should be able, if David's free, we'll be able to fit in some jihad next week. And so, uh, in any case, thank you very much. And until next week, pray, hope, and don't worry.